Welcome to the Soul of Islam radio podcast with Ahmed Saqamini and Emil Ehsan Alexander Turabi. The Islamic Renaissance is here and now. May the peace, the mercy, the blessings, and the light of the divine be upon you all. My name is Ahmed, and I'm a researcher in atomic molecular optical physics, a spoken word artist, and deeply committed to sharing the fundamental connection between science and spirituality with our community and beyond. Ihsan is a lifelong student of Islamic spirituality and the founder and creator of the highly acclaimed Islamic Meditation and Eternal Warrior Way programs. He is a spiritual coach, writer, and speaker committed to the evolution of consciousness within the global community. The Soul of Islam radio podcast is dedicated to sharing the deeper dimension of Islam and supporting your personal growth and spiritual development. Today's podcast will be full of insight and spiritual teachings, inshallah. It's very special. In this episode, we will be interviewing our beloved Dr. Ibrahim Jaffe. He is a licensed medical doctor, a speaker, a spiritual teacher, and a healer. He is the founder of the University of Spiritual Healing and Sufism, as well as the Shadliya Sufi Center. He's known for his remarkable seminars, and alhamdulillah, thousands of people have embraced Sufism, the spiritual dimension of Islam, to his teachings. We are very pleased and excited to have him here today. Dr. Ibrahim Jaffe, assalamu alaikum, and welcome to the Soul of Islam Radio. Alaikum salam, wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. And welcome to both of you and to all your listeners, and I'm delighted to um, have the chance to share uh, some of the journey that I've been on with uh, Islam and Sufism over the past uh, 20 years. It's my, it's my delight to be here today. Alhamdulillah. And of course, joining me to interview our special guest is my very own brother and friend, Ihsan. Assalamu alaikum, akhi. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Again, welcome to all of our listeners and a special welcome to Dr. Jaffe. Had the pleasure of meeting you over the last uh, year or so a few times, and it's been an honor, a privilege. I've learned much from your teachings and from your programs. Here at the Soul of Islam Radio, we are committed to supporting our community in tuning into the leading edge of science, knowledge, and spirituality. Dr. Jaffe is one of the leading experts in the field of health and wellness and the emerging realization that the core cause of many illnesses, diseases, and conditions are often emotional or spiritual in nature. We're very excited. We're looking forward to this interview with you, Dr. Jaffe. Thank you. Thank you very much. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajim Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Maybe you can share with us just a little bit about your background, uh, whether it's in medicine or spirituality, a little bit more, so that the listeners know a little bit more about yourself, okay. inshallah. Uh, well, I, uh, as you mentioned, I'm a physician. I went to University of Illinois uh, in Chicago and also in Urbana, uh, Big Ten School, and uh, became a, a medical doctor. I was working on a PhD and uh, decided to shift gears and go into medicine. The reason we kind of interesting was that as a child, we had a dog, and uh, I remember I had put my hand on this dog, and and there was this large, what appeared to me to be like a hard growth on its uh, hip. And I went to my mother and I said, uh, you know, Mom, what what is this? What's this this uh, thing? And she said, there's nothing there. What are you talking about? I said, can't you feel this? It's like the size of a grapefruit. I'm saying it's, it's big. And she's saying, you're absolutely out of your mind. There's nothing there. I said, no, you're wrong. There's something here. So they ignored it. And uh, five years later, out of nowhere, the dog grew a large grapefruit-sized tumor out of that hip. So my mother was like, began to question. She said, "What well, this, this child seems to have some awareness of something that we're not perceiving. So she began to sort of um, guide me towards more... Um, healing arts. She was like, well, you seem to be aware of things we're not aware of, you know, ahead of time, so can you can you work on that? So that was how I ended up going into medicine. And uh, it was, that was the, the beginning of the process. And 
for me, uh, medical school was a very, very interesting and somewhat difficult time because on one hand, you know, we're learning to develop our minds. And of course, medicine's very, it's really a fraternity. You know, you really have to think a certain way and you have to act a certain way and you talk a certain way and you have to become part of it, which, you know, I was doing. But behind all of it, I was very interested in something much different, which was really why people were getting sick. You know, what was the real reason for it? And I found that 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 skill I had as a child hadn't left me. And that as I was with people, I began to also sense many things. Like I would be finding, you know, secrets about their illnesses that the physicians weren't really aware of. So, you know, for me, I had to, had to journey on my own because there was nobody to turn to. There was nobody to help me. There was no guide. I just had me, you know, so I was going through and I would begin to explore, well, what was I feeling? You know, if somebody came in, they had, let's say, pain in their body somewhere. But when I was with them, I felt intense pain in my pancreas. Why was I feeling intense pain in my pancreas when they were being diagnosed with something else? So I began to say, all right, well, let me see if I run some lab tests on the pancreas. Maybe there's going to be some secrets about their pancreas. And of course, lo and behold, it turned out to be right. That what I was feeling would show up as slight abnormalities in the lab tests, which later, as time went on, would show up as pancreatitis or would show up as a tumor or would show up as other things. So I began to work with that first level of understanding, which is that we can perceive subtle things through, you know, whatever our bodies are capable of, our subtle consciousness is capable of, and that there were subtle, subtle clues. But as time went on, um, I had a very profound experience in the, in the ICU. I was working in the intensive care unit when they, this was in Chicago, and they brought in a, a Jewish girl from uh, one of the academies, the Chicago academies. And it was very strange because it's a small academy. They had like 40 children in each class of high school. So maybe, you know, 150 kids or something. And of the 150 kids, there were a number of the, a number of these children that had died in the past year. They were dying of, of, of strange causes. So there was a question about whether they were being poisoned, about whether there was some type of gin, you know, what was causing the deaths of these young people. Well, the girl who was 17, who showed up in the ICU, was one of these children. And she came under my care. Uh, and when I received her, she had um, what you would call a chronic hepatitis end stage. So when I reached her, she was in coma. She had full-blown ascites. Ascites means her whole body was swelled up because the liver wasn't functioning. And when the liver doesn't function, it doesn't make protein. When it doesn't make protein, the water seeps out of the whole body. So her body was kind of like, um, it was not nice to look at. It was very swollen. And, and she was young. She was 17. I had, was the youngest person I had seen in the ICU. So, you know, I came to examine her. And again, you know, as a physician, we do a traditional examination. And when I placed my, my stethoscope on her body, I felt like I didn't know what hit me. I just knew that something very bad happened. As I touched her, I felt like something cold and icy came out of her body. I felt incredible pain in my body. Like I almost, I almost fell down on the floor with, with agony. The pain was so strong. Couldn't, I could barely stay conscious. I didn't know what was in this girl, but I knew something very strong was happening. And I didn't understand it. But that was my first experience of something, what I would call, you know, so powerful that was actually life-threatening to somebody. So I began to, you know, didn't really know what to do about that. But the, the girl was involved in a very big controversy in Chicago because of her age and things. And all of the rabbis from Chicago came in, the Orthodox Jewish rabbis came in. At that time, there were maybe 30 of them. And they all came to our hospital. So I was involved in the hospital. They decided that they would call to Jerusalem. And they called Jerusalem and they spoke with the head rabbi in Jerusalem. And they went into some of the ancient Jewish books, the Talmud. And they found a cure for hepatitis. Uh, they called it yellow hepatitis. She was all yellow. So the cure was they brought um, doves 
and they placed doves on this girl's belly. And the story was if the doves died, the dove would be pulling out the disease in some fashion. So sure enough, they brought in 30, 30 rabbis came in with a box of big box full of doves, all white doves, you know, and some gray doves. And they placed the dove on the girl's belly. And sure enough, within, I would say, three seconds, the dove passed out and died. It just literally fell over dead. And we were watching this, and I was watching it, and just, you know, my mouth dropped open. It was like, what in the world is going on here? That, you know, first of all, that, you know, where does this understanding come from? Why is this dove dying? And what is the, you know, and then I thought about what happened to me, that cold, dark thing that I almost died from. I felt like I was about to die. And of course, you know, if a sensitive bird, it would make sense that the bird would perhaps die from that. Well, they went through 18 birds. Each one took longer and longer. The first one died in three seconds. The second one, maybe a minute. The third one in 10 minutes. Three and a half hours later, 18 birds later, um, the girl's vital signs completely stabilized. Completely. And this is a girl who was borderline. I mean, she was dying. I mean, she had her blood pressure was 60 over zero which means they couldn't find the diastolic pressure. That, I mean, there was no blood pressure, really. Her, her pulse was 140. You know, normal is 80. Uh, her respirations were 20 to 30. Normal is, you know, 14, 15. So she was breathing very fast, getting rid of the acid, and all this type of thing. But at the end, she completely stabilized her, all of her vital signs, everything stabilized. And I watched how this ancient Talmudic thing that was thousands of years old actually healed a 17-year-old girl that all the modern medicine, you know, the, that we were using, the antivirals, the cortisones, the everything we had didn't touch it. She was, we had no recourse with her. And this ancient tradition did. And I, I sat with it for a long time and I said to myself, you know, I love medicine. And I, till today, I love medicine. It's, a, it's absolutely a fabulous thing to study. And it's, it's interesting. And the biochemistry and the DNA is fabulous. But to know that there are secrets of healing that are beyond what we have, which demonstrated without doubt. So that began my process. I said, I, I completed my boards, I took my boards, and from that moment forward, I went all over the world and I studied with the teachers in every corner of the world, South America, Central America, the Hawaiian Islands, Japan, India, uh, everywhere I could find people who were healers, I studied with them. Psychic surgeons from the Philippines, everybody. I was seeking to understand what were the secrets of healing. I spent the next 20 years studying all over the world. And that led in time to my own illness, which is that I developed heart disease and I, I was dying. And I went through everyone I knew and uh, I almost everyone I knew, but everything I had learned would not work. So I began saying, well, why, you know, how do you heal? What is the heart? The heart's the station of love. So if my heart is dying, what it really means is somewhere I don't know love. So who do you learn love from? Where do you go to learn love? If you really, and at this point I was in a, a marriage. My marriage was struggling. I had two young children, but we were, we were having a hard time. And I thought, who could help me with my marriage? Or maybe it was related to my marriage. Maybe it was related to my, my inability to love. And everybody kept saying in the end, they said, the ones who know the love more than any people in the world are the Sufis. That's what I heard. And I didn't know what Sufis were. I said, what is Sufism? They said, it's the mystical aspect of Islam. And I said, well, where in the West would you ever meet a Sufi? Because, you, know, you know, where do you meet Sufis? And uh, eventually, shortly after that, a very, very uh, well-known Sufi came to the West. He was an imam uh, of, a, of uh, a major mosque. He was uh, very deeply respected in Jerusalem, in Jordan, uh, in the Islamic world. He was a high scholar and the judge of all the judges in that part of the world for the, is the Islamic community. And yet behind he was also Sufi. And I met him and I walked in and he didn't know me, didn't know anything about me. We looked at each other and we smiled at each other. He looked at me. He said, first thing he said to me, he said, you know, he said, you're dying. And I said, oh, you're exactly right. I said, how could you know I'm dying? He said, if you surrender and you put your head down completely and you open to the light of Allah, Allah can reveal things to you from time to time. 
And I said, so what happened? He, he said, yes. He said, I, I became aware that you, as, as, I, as I said, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, I became aware that your heart was dying. I felt it in my being. I said, this was from Allah. He said, this is from, from the light, from the qualities, the names of God. And I said, does Allah show you anything else about my illness? Can he, can he heal me? Because I'm dying. I, they gave me six months. He said, he went inside a long, long time. And he came back. He closed his eyes, maybe 15 minutes, 20 minutes, a long time. And he came back. He said, when I go inside and I pray for you, I feel you can heal. But if you're going to heal, you have to learn two things. He said, first, you have to learn to love, which I knew in my heart. And he said, secondly, he said, you're going to have to drop all of the teachings that you've learned all over the world, and you're going to have to embrace Islam. And you're going to have to embrace the deeper mystical understandings hidden within the Sufi teachings within Islam if you're going to heal your heart. He said, are you willing to do that? I said, are you certain that if I do this, you can heal me? In other words, I have six months to live. I can't make a mistake. If you're wrong, I die. I said, are you, can you give me your word? Can you give me a word from Allah, if you can, that, that you can help me? And he said, I give you my word that if you, inshallah, if you embrace this way and you, you, know, you open and you walk this way, that your heart will heal. That was uh, over 20 years ago. And within three months, I was feeling better. Within one year, my heart returned to perfect normal. And uh, within two years, I had no heart disease whatsoever. It was completely gone. So he completely healed me. That's, that's how I began this journey with uh, Sufism and Islam and mysticism. And um, it's been, I've studied with this man now 18 years, have spent thousands and thousands of hours teaching and learning people to heal. And, and that's, how, that's how I come to here to speak with you today. SubhanAllah, what an amazing journey, what an amazing story. I wish we had more time to go into details. But just maybe if I could ask you, Dr. Ibrahim, You've had experience on many different traditions, many different healing modalities. What have you found that might be unique to Islam and its spiritual dimension, Sufism or Tasawwuf, that may not be present or perhaps not expressed as fully in other traditions? Mm. And perhaps how can this path specifically help a human being to heal on all levels, emotionally, mm. spiritually, as well as physically? Mm. Mm. It's a great question. That's a really great question. Now, first of all, let me just be really clear that I've, I've looked into traditions, Vedantic, Hindu. I've studied in Japanese temples in, in, uh, in Japan uh, with Philippine psychic surgeons, with shamans, with um, American Indians, uh, with Sioux Indians, other tribes. And I've studied etheric surgery and, and all sorts of other more new agey type of things, such as uh, bioenergetic therapy, gestalt therapy, psychotherapy, and, and, and. I'm just, the reason I'm saying this is I'm saying that I have a lot of background in, in many, many traditions. And um, Islam is, is the jewel. It is the true jewel. And it's, it's, it, it is the jewel of jewels. And this is, this is coming not from, you know, being within the religion saying, you know, I know it is because I've been told it is. It's coming from somebody who's been in many, 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 many varied things and found the deepest truth, in my opinion. Okay, so why do I feel that this is the jewel? Because in, in the work that I do with healing, Islam is the purest. In my experience, it carries the purest light. It's absolutely pure. There's no impurity in it. And that's what makes it so special. All the other traditions are connected in different ways to God. They all have some... Every, every tradition has a connection to God in some way. Most traditions. Unless they're following shaitan, of course. But most of them have connections to God. But few have the pure... This pure white light. This pure... You know, uh, you know the Prophet spoke, peace and blessings be upon him, about you know, this, this white... Sharia, I've let you. I've left you this Sharia, whose light is is as bright as day. This pure light. This is Islam. It's absolutely impeccably pure. And the people who are drawn to this path, I mean, many people, of course, are raised in it. And you know, many people raised in it um, have not really fully embraced it. They practice it, but they're really not that interested in it. You know, research has shown that uh, probably uh, only if you go to most mosques today, only maybe three percent of the people even know the Quran. 
and most people haven't really studied the Quran, they don't really understand it, um, the inner teachings are not very well known. You know, so it, because a person is raised in Islam doesn't necessarily mean that they've really embraced the deeper aspects of it, is my personal experience. So the people who have traveled, you know, in other words, for me, you know, coming in as a as not a born Muslim, but somebody who, who converted to it, um, I began to seek that purity. And Islam, it is, in my opinion, it carries the absolute pure light of God. It's perfect. And is if we can surrender to that light, and we can really understand it, then the light of Allah, this impeccable light, it can heal anything and change anything in one moment. And I know that um, many people feel that by praying their salah, or they feel that... Um, you know, they do the Ramadan, they do their fasting, or, or they practice the five pillars, that that they've embraced Islam. In my experience, Islam is much broader than that. It's, it is a much vaster system of learning. And there's an outer and an inner aspect to it. The outer, of course, is what? It's the Sharia, right? And it's the fiqh, and you know, and it's the the Arabic and it's the understanding of the language and you know all these type of things that are part of the outer teachings and and of course it's also the actions we see many people they have very good adab you know they're really they have the actions they're very pure they make their wudu beautifully they um, they speak in a nice way and they're learning their actions in a very deep way but often behind those actions you don't always see the same thing right you go home, if you were in their house, you'd see that same person who is making impeccable voodoo, treating his wife very badly, screaming at her, yelling at her, not treating her with love. Or you see, you see that the emotional states of the people have not been purified. The outer is pure, but the inner is not pure. So the emotional states are not really perfect. For example, one of my patients was from Amman, Jordan. Very, very, very well-known professor, very, very well. But she developed cancer. She was dying of cancer. Her, I mean, her Islam was beautiful. It was, you know, her, her Arabic, perfect. Her uh, Sharia, stunning, perfect. But why cancer? What was really going on deep inside? Well, behind everything, the emotional states within her were not settled. She was not feeling loved by her husband. She was not. She was alone. She was isolated. She wasn't getting what she needed. The cancer was a reflection of all the pain inside of her. So because the outer was good, the inner wasn't good. You know, it wasn't she was doing anything wrong, but she was sad. She was constantly lonely. She wasn't getting the care she needed. She didn't. She was constantly worried about her her children. Were her girls going to be married? She was constantly anxious. All of that led to her cancer. When we began working on dealing with those issues, the cancer began to disappear. It began to it, it began to withdraw. Now, eventually, she did stop with the work with me. It was hard to do it overseas, and and then you know a year or two later, she did eventually die. But but she lived much longer than they expected. They expected her to to leave shortly, a few months, and instead she lived a few years, or at least a year or two and more from the work. So what's the point? The point is that that um, as Muslims, we have obligation to learn the outside, right? We need to learn how to do the Sharia the right way. But there's a secondary piece, which is much more important. I would say more important. It's as important, which is the inner states. Are we happy? Are we angry? Are we sad? Are we anxious? So there's the emotional state that goes inside. And then there's something even very much deeper. And this, this is really the teachings of Sufism. Now, I know that many Muslims have, you know, a weary eye with Sufism. They don't trust it. And I understand that. But I want to tell you about the Sufism that I learned, which if you understand it, you will not have a weary eye. You will actually, you will embrace it wholeheartedly. Which is that in Sufism that I learned, which is Shadaliya Sufism, that the whole secret is the purification of the qualities inside the person. So, for example... Let's say we talk about a Rahman. Rahman is the light of, is the compassion of God, right? But each person has some Rahman inside of them, right? They have compassion. But is your compassion inside your heart 
really the reflection of Allah's compassion? I mean, are you really compassionate in the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is compassionate? Or are you compassionate in your way? Meaning maybe a little bit compassionate. Maybe you're compassionate with yourself sometimes. So in the deep way, in the Sufism I learned, what we're really learning is how do we, how do we become uh, like mirrors? How can our compassion reflect the Rahman? That we can carry some of his light within our heart and that we can have some of that true compassion inside our being. There are 99 names. So we have to learn the 99 mirrors of those names. And in illness, all illness is nothing more than the veiling of the names. This is what people don't understand. If somebody has an illness, on one hand, they, maybe the illness is due to anger. Because many illnesses are arthritis. Anything has an itis, it's anger. You have arthritis, pneumonitis, uh, you know, you name it, glomerular nephritis, you have anger issues. That anger, if it's glomerular nephritis, it's anger in your kidneys. If it's rheumatoid arthritis, it's anger in your joints. If it's pneumonitis, it's anger in your, in your lungs. If you have itis, you have too much heat from the fire of anger, and that anger is causing disease. But behind those emotional states, there's the qualities, the names. Why are you angry? Because maybe you don't have enough rahim. Maybe your mercy is not deep enough. So you, you, maybe you don't have enough ghafur. You don't forgive. You can't forgive. You hold things. Maybe you don't have enough atawab. You don't really make repentance to Allah when you make mistakes. Or maybe you don't accept people's repentance when they make mistakes and you, and you hold it inside yourself. You see, you see each, each disease is nothing but the veiling of divine names. Our work as Sufis and human beings and Muslims is to find out the secrets. If you have rheumatoid arthritis, you have anger in your joints. If you look in your joint, you'll see that you actually are very angry. You want to strike out with that joint. If you look deep, you'll find the rage in the joint. If you don't deal with that rage and get to the root of it, that, that arthritis will cripple you. If you release it, you'll see the arthritis disappear. And, you, and I have seen joints, I have seen joints that where people were ready for hip surgery. You know, they were going to have like replacements, hip replacements. And they have done this work and the hip returned relative. All the pain disappeared and the hip joint began to return towards normal. The body can respond in amazing ways if we deal with the issues. MashaAllah, you've mentioned earlier about 18 years ago uh, when you met Sheikh in Jerusalem. Could you tell us a little bit more and the listeners about maybe your first spiritual encounter or maybe how you came to know and embrace Islam? Uh, yes, it's a very good question. Again, remember that I had spent um, probably, you know, from maybe 15 years old to 35, which is what, uh, 20 years, you know, studying alternative systems, working with learning about healing. You know, and there were many, many different traditions and different ways of going out. And some of the systems that were very strong for me were things like Gestalt therapy. Gestalt is where you you sort of get into what you're experiencing and you express it. So it's kind of the stuff that was happening in the 60s and the 70s. So I got involved with Gestalt therapy and bioenergetic therapy. And when you do that kind of work and you start to really, you know, express your anger or you express your sadness and you cry and you really let it out... Two things happen. One of them is that you you first feel 100% better. But something else magnificent happens that if you really, really express your feelings fully, your consciousness expands. You start to become more aware. You actually start to notice that sounds are more present. You see, when you look, you'll see things differently. Like everything is so clear, so beautiful. You start to look at a tree and you'll start to see, you can almost see the light of the tree vibrating out of the tree. Uh, you look at life and you start to see Allah's presence in everything. It's like it begins to permeate every part of existence. And existence becomes this incredible experience. It's not just, it's like you're, you're not just with Allah practicing what you've been taught, you're living the experience of it. It's a, it's a, liv a living experience. So a lot of that had opened for me at that point, although I was not a Sufi or a Muslim at that point, but I had explored enough that I had learned, I was learning about the presence of God from direct experience, meaning that 
I would, I would express my anger, and then after the anger had completely left me, I'd go outside, and I could feel as if even the air was alive with the presence of divinity. So one day, this lady, one of my, my uh, people who used to promote my seminars in, in Europe, I used to teach in Europe a lot, and she said to me, oh, Dr. Jaffe, can you come and talk to my son? I said, why? She said, he's done a terrible, terrible thing. I said, what has he done? She said, he became Muslim. <laughs> and I said, oh, why, you know, why is that a terrible thing? And she said, it's, she was very upset about it. She's Christian, and very upset. And I said, what, what has happened? She said, well, not only has he become Muslim, but he made Hajj. And he photographed it. She said, I want you to look at this. I want you to come and see the Hajj. Because, you know, this is a very secret thing. You know, no, you know, videos and things from at that time were not allowed. This was back in the early 90s or late 80s. I, they weren't really out there. So I went to her house and she showed me the video. And I was expecting to see something. I didn't know what I was expecting to see, honestly. But I went in and I saw the, the film of the circambulation of the Kaaba. And I'm looking at this. And I'm watching, you know, thousands of people, you know, making the uh, tawuf around the, the Kaaba. When all of a sudden, it was as if, I don't know really what happened to me, except I could say maybe the angels came. And uh, it was like I entered into another space, another state of consciousness. And in that space, as I was looking at the circambulation, I felt and saw, actually felt and saw the most extraordinary pure light, white light, from the Kaaba and from the people. It was like pulsing, like, like a spotlight going up into heaven, like I had never seen anything in my life. And not only was it going up into heaven, but the heavens were responding and sending it down. It was like a communication, like they were going back, like pulsing up, and then God pulsing down. And I looked, and I was so stunned. She said, what's going on? I said, Islam carries, this is the greatest experience of light and healing I have ever seen in my travels throughout the whole world. She said, are you out of your mind? I'm I said, I'm telling you that I don't know what we're being told on the radio and the TV. This thing, this, this circambulation, this Hajj, I said, is the great, maybe for me, it's the greatest light I've ever seen. This is, this is a secret and it's being condemned. And then it made sense to me, of course, wouldn't the shaitan condemn the great light so people wouldn't go to it? I mean, it would make sense, right? You would make it wrong. You have to make it wrong. Otherwise, because then people would come and they would be healed. And I said, this is, this, in that moment, I said, the place I need to go is here. And that is how I became uh, a Sufi and a Muslim. All this happened prior to meeting the Sheikh. This was maybe two or three years prior to meeting him. And at that time, I was a Western, you know, I was living in the West, and our impression of Islam was not a good one. You know, what happened in Iran, and, and that had to do with terrorism, and people were scared, and I was scared. And we, we, were, we believed that it was a bad thing. This is what we were taught. But, you see, this, this totally changed everything for me because I realized, that, I realized that if what I was seeing and experiencing in this Hajj was real, then Islam carried in its core the greatest light that I had ever seen. And if I was a true seeker of truth and healing, then I had to go past the impressions that the media had put into me to understand the truth of Islam. And that's what opened my heart. And then several years later, that's when I met the Sheikh. So we, as, as the Westerns, you know, I mean, people living here, we know this, that the Western media paints a very bad picture, you know, of things. But, you know, that's why I speak, because um, I want people to know the truth. I think we all need to know the truth. And, and, and the truth is within all religions. There's truth within Christianity. There's truth within all the people of the book. There's truth within in, in Judaism. And there's certainly truth within Islam and, and truth within all things. But we have to find that truth and we have to not stop with what we have been taught. You know, even in the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that there were in, within Judaism, he said there were 71 sects and 70 of them were corrupted. And he said that within Christianity, there were 72 sects 
and 71 of them were corrupted. And he said that within Islam at this time, you know, and he talked about what we're seeing today, this many, many talks, you know, stories about this, that there would be 73 sects and 72 of them would be corrupted. So you see, within all traditions, we have corruption. And with all traditions, there's some truth. Maybe, you know, that one, that 73rd sect or that 72nd sect. There is truth within all things. Our job is to find that truth. And for me, this, this body is the metaphor of truth. If you treat your body with truth, you're healthy. Where you are not treating your body with truth, you will become unhealthy. You know, and it's not, it's not a judgment in the sense of we're not doing anything bad. It's more, like, uh, it's, like, it's more like the rules of the universe that Allah has created. In other words, if we don't express compassion, then the light of compassion blocks up in the body and becomes an illness. If we don't express peace, a salam, the salam blocks up in the body, we get anxiety, you know? So every, every quality ultimately has an illness related to it. It's, it's really more of sort of the, like gravity. It's like rules of the universe. And it's not that nobody's really, nobody doesn't want to be, everybody wants to be peaceful. We have to learn to be peaceful. Everybody wants to be, you know, learn mercy. But how do you really be merciful? You know, everybody said we talk about forgiveness, but do we really forgive? You know, these are the big ones. Forgiveness, mercy, compassion, holiness, kudus, al hay. You know, if you have lung diseases, um, you know, COPD, you know, where you can't breathe, asthma, things like this. This is all about al hay. You know, epilepsy. You know, epilepsy is almost 90% of the time, unless there's been an actual physical injury, it's about the jinn. The jinn are coming in and they're getting into people's mind. The jinn go out, the epilepsy often disappears. We've seen, we've seen m- multiple cases of that. Mm-hmm. You know, cancer is when people give up. They, they give up, they lose hope, and they lose faith. al mukmin, al muhaymin, they lose faith, they lose trust. You, bring, you reestablish the trust and the faith and give them purpose, their cancer goes away. You know, so each disease is a metaphor of human existence. And that's really, as he, why are we here? Allah, Allah put us here. Why? He said, you know, he, we're not just here to, you know, reach Jannah. And that's part of it. But we're also here to what? To perfect ourselves. Allah, we're here to perfect our beings. We're here to, to go beyond and perfect. Allah says he loves those who have true taqwa. Taqwa, who have, you know, have true awareness. Not just fear of Allah, but awareness of Allah. It's a, it's a state of consciousness. We have to perfect that in ourselves. So the awareness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that in itself is a station that requires a lot of effort and a lot of work. And, you know, this spiritual healing that you've mentioned, there's a lot of potential there, even within the individual. Uh, it's a gem that Islam can offer yes. a human being. Yes. And it feels like it requires the need to seek. So there's the act of seeking. We have to seek the truth. We have to apply Islam to its fullest to be able to unlock this potential within us. Yes. So, so which means we have to seek, which is initiated by the need to seek, yes. which is driven by this divine given himma, this mm. motivation, this, mm. this drive mm. that he has instilled inside of our hearts. Yes. Now, for many of us, for many of us, we don't have this himma. Or it's weak. Yes. Let's just say it's weak mm. within us. Mm. From your experience, what could help the individual, the human being, the mind, really, to bring this need mm. to seek to the surface mm. so that we may tap into the inner aspects of Islam? Yeah, and these are really great questions. And, um, you know, people's himma, you know, is, is really an issue today. Because a himma drives everything. If the himma, the passion is there, you go forward. If you don't have himma, then you don't do anything, right? And so how do we actually light the fires of himma, you know, passion in people? Well, the answer is a very simple answer. Tawbah, astaghfirullah every day, you know. Um, and the other one is dua. You know, we have to ask Allah for himma. So every day, you know, if you're feeling depressed, if you're down, you're tired, what do you do? You say, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I need, please help me to have true himma. Please restore my himma to my being. And Allah will send it to you. 
And then, of course, the other thing is, is but you, why did we lose our hema? You know why? Because we didn't resolve things. You know, something hurt. We got hurt. Somebody hurt us. We didn't resolve it. Why didn't we resolve it? We didn't work out that hurt. We didn't work out our anger. We didn't work out what happened to us. It sits inside of us like a poison. It poisons us. And then we start to become hopeless. We start to despair. We start to get depressed. What, what's the first thing that goes? Our hima. We don't care anymore. You know, it said that one of the signs of the ending times, one of the minor signs was people would pass by graves and they would look at the grave and they would say, I wish I was there. I wish I was there. And today, as you know, the suicide rates in this country, in the West and also in the Middle East are all going up significantly. And people are very depressed. Why? Because really in the deep place, they lost connection. They have no real connection. It seems like it's easier to leave. They wish to leave, but they don't realize that it's not any easier over there than it is over here. It's the same. You know, they're going to go a little different, but still the same. Not to leave. We have to break through. Many people today, they practice their Islam, but there's, there's not Himma in the Islam. You know, they're doing the Salat, they're doing their prayers, they're doing what they're supposed to do, but really they've lost something. Right? There's, there's sort of a depression. They're not sure why they're doing it. They're sad. What do you have to do? You have to make until you, you wash away what happened. You have to protect from shaitan. And, and really practice that. Say it. But then the other piece of it behind it, you know, of course, do your prayers because that will help. But behind it is really what's the wounding? You know, what happened? If you have, for example, if you have family like in overseas and they've been hurt in the war or, you know, or been unfairly treated, that might sit inside of you as anger or rage or sadness. How are you dealing with that rage? How are you dealing? Because hatred is not anybody's emotion but the devil. The shaitan, if you are full of hatred, you are really in the hands of shaitan. You've become, you unconsciously have become shaitan's hands. You have to move past the hatred to love. You have to overcome. So the real Muslim, you know, so many Muslims, we, we try to reach Jannah, right? We try to do everything so we reach Jannah. But this is like, this is the kindergarten of Islam. It's the beginning of Islam. Islam is, so, is, is a PhD program. It goes beyond just doing the Sharia and our practices. It's so rich. It is such a rich tradition that goes in every direction, unending. And the mysticism, which is the inner understanding of ourselves, who we are, our emotions, our inner states, our consciousness, our awareness, what we perceive, our relationship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our bowing, our prostration to Allah, the, the inner dynamics between our hearts and God, these things is the deeper aspect of Islam. And it is so rich and so beautiful right here. You don't have to go anywhere else. You spend your whole life studying this and you'll never, you'll never get there anyways. It's never ending. You know, even Prophet Muhammad wasalam, said he knew only, you know, just, just the touch of what Allah carried. You know, Allah was beyond transcendent of everyone. It goes on forever. So we as, as human beings have to not stop with just the actions. That's why we're tired. We have to, we have to drink and reach the love and drink the beauty and, and, and sit, you know. I see people, I, I walk outside, one person saying, oh my God, I have to pick up my kids from school and they're going to get hurt, and they're scared, and they're anxious, and they're afraid, and they drive over there, and the time they get there, they're sweating, and their hair is a mess, and they pick up their kids, and they're screaming at their kids. Okay, what happened? Where's, where's Wakil? Where's the trust? Well, where's Ya Wakil? What happened to... Well, where's Allah? Did Allah going to care for those children at all, or is it just, just the mom, you know? Where the next person who's somebody who's walked, they say, you know what? Allah is there. Yes, I need to be on time. I'll do my best. Allah will care for them. I get there, okay, something, I get stuck in traffic, Allah knows why. There's a reason for that. Then I'll be a little bit late, Allah cares. The person gets there, they're so grateful, their kids are fine. A shakur, they're thankful. The children are fine. Everything is fine. Allah is present. There is a much more beautiful way of living than being in constant stress and anxiety about everything. This is what we have to learn. Perhaps it can be said that love is the essence of the universe. And it seems to me that a lack of love or a lack of experiencing love can be at the core cause of so many symptoms, mm. illnesses, diseases, mm. emotionally, physically, psychologically. 
What would you suggest, Dr. Jaffe, for an individual to connect on a deeper level with the experience of love? How to experience love, especially if perhaps they're not getting it from their environment, from their relationships. If an individual is suffering from loneliness, what would be the key to connecting with or experiencing love and living from a place of love? Again, wonderful question. This is, this is what you have asked is the art of Sufism. I mean, this is the, this is the essence of Sufism because Sufism, again, you know, I want to, I want to respond that Sufism is not separate from Islam. Sufism is the mystical inner nature of Islam. If you're practicing Sufism and you're not practicing your Sharia, you have no Sufism. But on the same token, if you're practicing your Sharia and you don't have your inner, inner mysticism and you don't have the connection to love, you've missed Islam. Islam is the religion of love. It is the religion of love. But it is the purest love of all. It's the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is the greatest, purest love of all. So how do we do that? We use our relationships to come to that. So when you are, for example, if you're a man and your wife isn't loving you the way you want, what would you do? Most men, they get angry, right? And then they tell their wife they better do what they say. If they don't do what they say, then they, they say the wife is rebellious and they treat their wife badly. And maybe in time they hit her or divorce her or whatever, right? happens for many. Okay, but in Sufism, we look at it very differently. Let's say the same thing's happening. The first question a Sufi would ask would be the opposite. Not, why isn't my wife loving me? Why am I not loving my wife? So she loves me, you see? So the Sufi would go inside and say, what is my relationship to Yawadud? Am I manifesting Yawadud? Maybe there's a way that I'm not treating my wife with respect. Maybe there's a way that I'm not loving her respectfully. Maybe I need to be more gentle with her. Maybe I need to be more caring or more loving. So I would look to my own self first, and, and I would examine myself before I would blame somebody else. And I would, and because Allah will call us to account for our actions, right? Not for, you know, Allah is not going to call you to account for your wife's actions. He can call you to account for yourself. Well, my wife's not loving me, yes, but are you loving your wife? You see, so the first question is, you have to look inside yourself. And the first thing is, are you loving? Are you kind? Are you generous? Are you treating her with respect? Are you caring for her? Now, if you answer all those questions, yes, and the truth is you are, then you can turn to your wife and say, okay, my beloved wife, you know, why aren't you loving me? You know, and you ask her, you don't condemn her first. You ask her, why? Well, because you're too strong with me. Because you always tell me what to do. Okay, you know, then you have to talk to your wife. Well, what is it that you want to do? What is it that you need? What are you seeking? How can we have more love? What is it you want? And, and, and then you work with your wife together to, to reach those answers within the Sharia. In other words, you're not going to go outside of it, but within it. You know, maybe she needs to have time to um, be with herself more. Maybe she needs time to rest from being with the children all day. Maybe you could help with child care or, you know, maybe to put them into, you know, a school or something. So that you, the wife has some time to rest. She needs to rest a little bit. So in Sufism, the, the, the relationship to love is a reflection of the walking. Walking means the purification of your heart. The more you purify your heart, the more love you'll have. Love is, starts out like a little, it's like a little creek, you know, because like we have a little creek. Oh, I love you, you love me, we love each other, you know, we're happy. It's like a little creek. But then you clean your heart more. It becomes like a river. You start to experience incredible, vast movements of love. Like your heart becomes so strong, full of love. And you're loving people. Everybody else is crying, and, you, and you're finding the love. And then if you keep walking in time, your heart becomes an ocean. You become, your heart becomes uh, so rich and so full and so perfect in the presence of God that your heart becomes a divine ocean and that of love. And this is what we're really seeking is for these little streams, these little creeks to become rivers and then ultimately to become oceans through purification. It's called walking. May Allah inspire us all to truly experience love. But on that note, what would you say is the ultimate goal or the reality of a relationship between a husband and a wife? Mm -hmm. You know, it seems that it's much more. It's it's more than physical. It's mm. It feels like a divine union between mm. the two. Could you say a little bit more on that, please? Yeah, yeah this is the, again, and we would say that um, 
the ideal of a relationship in Islam is for people to become one body, one heart, one soul, and one secret. That there's a complete union of all those four aspects within within the marriage. Now, many what happens in many marriages, of course, is you know, it, unfortunately, things stop at the body. The body means one body means really we're speaking about intimacy, that people can be together, husband and wife. They love each other and they merge into each other. In other words, that the experience of intimacy is beautiful. It's not an obligation. It's not somebody doing because they have to do or somebody, you know, a lot of, you know, prophet peace and blessings be upon him said, don't be like a beast. You know, don't take, don't be with your woman like a beast. You know, it's not that it's about this intimate love and merging between two people. That's the body. But beyond the body, this is the heart. The heart is the place of love that you're speaking about. And, and in the state of love, you love your wife so much. She loves you so much that your hearts come together. And being together is absolute joy. There is so much joy and so much love. This is your best friend. This is the person that you're with, you feel great with. You love each other. You're so happy to be with. You're, you dance together. This is the heart. But there's a deeper state. There's very few people reach this state of consciousness, which is the soul. That the souls can come together and is very interesting. My experience with people who, when their souls come together, they actually begin to change. They look like each other. They take, as the, as the qualities merge, like your Rahim and her Rahim come together, you, your bodies will begin to look like as you take on her face, she takes on your face. You look just like each other. You be, you're really becoming one. You cannot believe it. There's some very deep merging that goes on. It's stunning. And the experience is transcendent. My first wife, um, Nada, uh, and I reached that level uh, many years ago before she died. And she, I remember, it was when we were together, it didn't matter where I was in the world, we were at that point together. So um, I remember one time I was walking in, uh, in Japan, I was in, to- in Tokyo, and something happened, and it, inst- it was something a little bit dangerous happened, and instantaneously I get a call, and she's on the phone, are you okay, what's going on over there? Are you watching this? You know, it's like she was right there with me, she knew every single thing I felt, everything I was, and she was protecting me and caring for me and helping me in that state. You see, my current wife and I also have this experience. And um, it's this this togetherness of the souls that come in this deep way. And of course, there's a deeper state than that called the secret. The secret is the spirit. Allah said, the Prophet said that the spirit is the inblown breath of God. It's the inblown breath of God. Into what? The soul. Allah blew the spirit into the soul, right? Okay. So what does that mean? It means in you, you have a soul, but you have a spirit. You have a soul and you have a spirit. I have a soul, we have a spirit. Our wives have a soul, they have a spirit. Our husbands have a soul, have a spirit. Yes, we can bring our souls together, you know, but to bring your soul together, you have to be conscious of your soul. How are you going to bring something together that you're unconscious about? Come on now. You have to be, you have to be aware, right? And, and that's why we have to really, we have to do our walking. We have to walk to know the awareness. Most people, we have to learn awareness of our hearts. We, we forgot our hearts. So we first learn our heart, and then we learn our soul. And then if you really, really learn your soul, you'll contact your spirit. The spirit is this absolute place of purity inside of your being. And when that place, and if your beloved, your wife or your husband, also reaches consciousness of the spirit, then the two spirits can join each other together, and in the joining of the together, this is the true worship of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. In this moment, within the spirit, the spirits prostrate to God. The breath of God prostrates to, its, its, to the one who blew the breath. And in that moment, you have pure ecstasy. And this is, this is the ultimate, in my opinion, the ultimate understanding of relationship is to reach that. Throughout your life, Dr. Ibrahim, you have been particularly sensitive. You've been of a sensitive nature and able to perceive things perhaps more so than uh, some others. And I think among our audience, there's probably also a higher percentage of individuals who are sensitive or might be considered hypersensitive, spiritually or emotionally or energetically sensitive. What would you suggest, number one, to help develop and cultivate that sensitivity, but at least as importantly, how to 
control or handle that sensitivity to protect oneself mm. from experiencing too much, from taking on too much from other people's energies, emotions, mm. illnesses? Mm. Well, it's, you know, that's a double question. So the first question is, you know, how do we actually expand our sensitivity? Mm. <clears throat> And, you know, some people are born with more sensitivity than others. That's, that's true. Um, you know, for example, some people carry more Latif. If you have Latif, you're going to be more sensitive and you'll be more aware of the subtle. It's part of your nature. You know, some people have more Salam. They're more peaceful. They may not be so aware, but they're peaceful. <laughs> so, you know, you have different, different qualities in different people. That's what makes everybody so beautiful because we're all different. In order to learn to be subtle to perceive the more, these deeper things. What it takes is a very deep state of purity. And by purity, what I mean is that if we purify the emotional states in ourself, in other words, if you have a lot of anger, you're not going to perceive subtle. If you have a lot of sadness, you're not going to perceive subtle. So you have to walk through or work through the anger. Everybody will have anger always. The Prophet Muhammad had anger at times, right? Peace and blessings. He, he, he had anger at different things, but his anger was very pure. It came from Allah. It was Allah's unhappiness with what was happening. You know, most of us have not that level of purity. But if we carry a lot of, you know, things in our heart where we, we sit and, and we, 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 we struggle with things and we, can, we constantly think about them, those act as veils inside of us and we can't perceive the subtle. If we work those through, so we start, okay, well, okay, you know, people in Los Angeles are, I mean, my experience driving the freeways here, they're a little bit scary, actually. People are kind of crazy drivers down here. And, you know, maybe this is what happens in L.A. There's more, I don't know what, why people drive that way, but they do. So if I'm angry about that, then I would lose my subtle consciousness. But if I'm accepting of that, then the subtle opens, you see? So it has to do with purity. Um, another example, I'll tell you a story about uh, I was driving my children back from Florida after my wife died. And uh, we were driving home because uh, we had picked up a, a car that her father had given us. And we drove from Florida to New Mexico, and the drive was stunning. And by the time we got to New Mexico, I, f I felt I was so, I was in so much joy and so much ecstasy and so much beauty. And then the children got hungry. You know, and where do you eat halal food in the middle of New Mexico? You just can't find anything. There's nothing there, you know, except the children begged. They said, please, Dad, can we eat some meat? Can we want to have some meat? I said, okay, where do you want to eat at? They said, okay, Burger King. I like, I shouldn't, I should, no, I don't know. Okay, Burger King. I said, isn't that halal? The dad, isn't it the case that if you're hungry and you can't find food, you can eat what you need to find? I said, yes, that's true, but I'm sure we could eat something else. But I finally said, yes, okay. So we go into the Burger King, and I ordered a hamburger. Everybody got hamburgers. And I had a very bad feeling. I took the hamburger to my mouth. I took one bite, just one bite. Within seconds, the joy, the ecstasy, the beauty, the light literally folded itself up. It was like it just disappeared. It was gone. It was like I was sitting in this expanded state of so much beauty. I took the bite it was as if somebody folded up, like 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 somebody had folded a box or, or something, just collapsed. All the light disappeared, and within a matter of, I would say, 30 seconds, 15 seconds, the, the whole experience was over. It was gone. It took me, I don't know, weeks or months to get back to that experience again. From one haram choice. Okay, so purity is, the, the, what we're saying that there's, to learn the subtle, you have to have pure heart and to keep your body pure and eat purely, to fast. These are the ways you open to the subtle. Now, once you open, then that leads to the second question, which is, is how do you deal with being open? Well, the secret is not to open too fast. You see, it's like if you open slowly, step after step, 
it will become like breathing. You will just live open and you won't even realize you're open. It'll just be easy for you. It's when you open too fast that you can't handle it. So the secret is not, this is why people today, they take drugs, like, you know, the things happening out in the world today, all these drugs people take. They open their consciousness too fast. They can't handle it. Then they break down. They, they, they break. They have schizophrenia. Like one of my students called me yesterday. She, was, she went to Peru, her sister. And in Peru, they gave her um, a drug called ayahuasca. And in, she took the ayahuasca, and she had a uh, psychotic. She became psychotic. She's now in uh, Lima, in, the, in a psych hospital in, with full-blown schizophrenia from the ayahuasca. Why? Because she opened something she shouldn't have opened. She took a drug that opened something. The results of it were... It blew her consciousness out. She couldn't deal with it. Now she has psychosis. In, in, in our work, you open very, very slowly, step after step after step after step. You don't even know you've opened. You just become a little bit more aware, a little bit more aware, a little bit more aware. Now, if you do open and you begin to see things, and some people will as you open, you know, and of course, unfortunately, um, some of the things people see when they open is they begin to perceive shaitan. They begin to actually feel shaitan or they pre- because that's actually sometimes the first thing people perceive. Then you have to have protection. And in the, you know, in the Prophet wasalam, has over and over again gone through that. You know, there are so many protections. The cools, Awud Ablahim in a shaitan regime, you know, Ayol Kursi, there's many, many protections for you know, if shaitan shows up in your world. So you have to learn those and you have to practice them. And also you stay away from places. You know, if you, there are places shaitan lives, right? There are places where shaitan, there are, you go to a bar, a shaitan, if you go into a bar, you're going to meet shaitan. He's going to be on the inner and he's going to be in people. And you're going to, you walk into a bar, you're going to see shaitan. Don't go to a bar. This is where he's living. You know, there are many places like that. So you have to also learn to stay away from those places. Could you share with us, Dr. Jaffe, perhaps one example or two, if you like, of a remarkable healing, something that has been profound and that would be of some value to our listeners, perhaps based on some of the things that you've mentioned thus far, where an inner imbalance was addressed, corrected, Mm -hmm. and how that resulted and manifested physically? Sure. Let me tell you a story about uh, a lady with congestive heart failure. Uh, this is a woman, she was um, in her early 50s. And in congestive heart failure, you know, the heart is a pump. And what happens is the pump begins to fail. And in congestive heart failure, when, as the pump fails and the pump can't push the blood out, the pressure backs up the heart and the heart expands. When the heart gets to be about three times the size of normal, it goes into what's called end-stage failure. End-stage failure means that the, they, the, no matter what medicines they give you, they can't get the heart to pump. Okay, when the heart stops pumping, the person dies. And the way they measure this is they have something called the ejection fraction. Ejection fraction is a, a way of measuring the pump value. You and I probably have 40 to 50, you know, 40, 45 percent ejection fraction. But somebody in, in end stage, they have 20 percent. Okay, you get below 20 percent, you pretty much die. The woman came in, she was at 21%. Okay, so they were giving her very short time to live. Maybe, you know, when you have 20% failure and you're taking all medicines, you know, maybe you have three to six months, if you're lucky. So she came in, this was a lady, and actually had two almost exact ones, They're very similar, the same, same ejection fraction. But uh, the first one, she came in to my personal retreat intensive. There's a four-day thing I did. And she said... Um, I'm dying. I've got three to six months to live. Can you help me? I said, okay, yes, I hope so. Let's try. So using what I had learned in Sufism, we began to explore her heart, not the physical heart, but the emotional and the psychological, the spiritual. And what she believed as we got to it was that she had gone out to New Mexico and she was Christian and she was part of a Christian community, and there was a priest. And she was living in a house, and she went out to be part of that community. It was a spiritual community. And the priest mistreated her. He didn't abuse her, but he did something not right with her. 
Anyways, um, what she believed happened after that was that there was a, a what they call a sewer gas leak. In other words, in the sewers, you know, there's a lot of gas that's, you know, from the whatever happens to fermentation within the sewers. The, the underneath the gas came out of the ground. That gas is very toxic. She believes she breathed it, and that, that it was the gas that caused her heart to die. Okay, so she felt she had, I don't know what they're calling it, swamp gas or sewer gas. I remember what she called it. Okay, so, you know, we began exploring, and I said, well, what if it wasn't that? And she said, well, what else would it be? And when I felt it, I said, it feels to me like you have a broken heart. She said, what do you mean a broken heart? She got angry. I said, well, it feels to me like you're angry and your heart is deeply, deeply sad. What happened? And she eventually came out that she went out, she gave her whole life to be part of the spiritual community. She went out, you know, ready to be with God. The priest was not practicing the love and there was things that went on there, which I don't want to go into, but she felt very mistreated and it broke her heart. It broke her dream. In the breaking of the dream, in the breaking of her heart, in the breaking of her belief in the in the teaching that she was receiving there, her heart, I believe her heart collapsed. And it was not the swamp gas or the sewer gas, it was the broken heart. So what we did is we used uh, dhikr, meaning we used tawbah, staghfir al we used remembrance of the name Allah, we used la ilaha illallah, we use some divine names like Ar Rahim, Ar Rahman, Al Qudus, Al Hayal Kayum, and we began doing recitation. But not only did we rec recite those, and I'm telling you many things, but we also went to the place inside of her that had lost the mercy and reestablished it. There's ways to do that. That's part of healing. How do you reestablish the mercy? And we helped her come back to trust, come back to mercy, come back to love, come back to the belief that there was hope in the world, that there wasn't only despair. And she found it. She found it all. She got back within four days. It was, we worked, you know, every day for a little bit. Then four days, she got back. This was a group of maybe 10 or 11 people. At the end of four days, she said, I feel so much better. I don't know. I feel like I'm breathing better. I'm moving better. I'm not so tired. Three months later, she goes back in for, and also taught her the, the practice of dhikr. She was saying, Allah, Allah, Allah. She was, she was saying, la ilaha illallah. She was practicing it every day. Okay. Three months later, she goes back for her cardiac ejection fraction and her chest x-ray. What do you think they found? Completely normal. The heart had completely healed. Normal size, normal ejection fraction, all signs of congestive heart failure disappeared in three months. It wasn't gas. It wasn't anything. It was that she had given up on life. And when she found the way back through healing, she returned and she got her, her heart back. And I'll tell you one more story because I just think it's valuable for your listeners. Is There was a lady um, who had breast cancer. And she had a number of small tumors in her breast. Okay, and they decided to do mastectomy. You know, breast cancer is like the number one cancer for ladies today. And um, she called me, and we began looking. I said, you know, why do you think you have breast cancer? She said, I have no idea why. And as we started getting into the cancer, she found rage. She was raging. She was raging. I said, what are you raging about? What's all this rage in this tumor? And she said, I'm so angry at these people. There were people around her. She was so furious with them. And I said, why are you? And she they don't treat me right. They don't respect me. They don't honor me. They're not taking care of me. They don't give me the respect. But you see, in Sufism, remember what I said in the beginning, it's not really about anybody else. It's really about us. So I said to her, let me ask you a question. Is it possible that the people are mirroring you? I said, well, she said, what do you mean? I said, is it possible that you're not giving the love, that you're not caring for the people, and the people are treating you that way because of you? She was really mad at me. I mean, she was yelling at me, who do you think you are, and what kind of teacher are you, what kind of healer are you, blah, blah, blah. She got really, really mad at me. I said, all right, I may be wrong, but my experience is usually with things like this, we have to look inside ourselves. So let's go out of blaming others, and let's look at yourself. What did these people say to you? She said, well, they say that I don't love them. 
And I said, well, I thought you said they weren't loving you. She said, well, I'm not. Well, I don't know what's real, but that's what they say. I'm not loving them. And I said, I see. Well, are you loving them? She said, well, when they respect me, I love them. And when they don't respect me, I don't. And I said, well, is it possible that Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, is trying to teach you to love them no matter what? To give them the milk of love, because the breast is the milk of love, the milk. Are you, that Allah wants you to give them milk. Are you giving them the milk? She said, no, I'm not. In fact, if they do anything I don't like, I shut the milk off immediately. I don't give them the love anymore. I said, I think this is the problem. So I said, let's see if we can change them. And, and she worked very, very hard. She really, she did work very hard with it. And she shifted it within a very short time, within a month or so. She, she, she said, you know, I realize that I've been selfish. I realize that I withhold the love. I realize that when people don't give me what I want, I stop loving them. I said, okay, so you're learning to give them milk no matter what. She said, yes. Anyways. Seven weeks later, eight weeks later, she prayed, she did this. She goes in for her surgery. They redo the the uh, mammogram. Guess what? The tumor's gone. Completely disappeared. Eight weeks, nine weeks, disappeared, gone. Just like that. So, again, these are the teachings I'm trying to say to people is if we can understand what's really moving inside of ourselves, if we have the courage and the honesty to be real with it, you know, to find out. It's a secret. It's, our, it's a secret about ourselves. We don't really know. We have to find it. You know, it's why we're sick, because we don't know. We have to We have to go beyond what we think to what's really true. She didn't know she was withholding the love until she got the mirror that she was withholding it. The lady with the swamp gas or the, the sewer gas, she didn't know she had a broken heart. She didn't realize that. She didn't know. She knew she was hurt, but she didn't realize how deeply she was hurt. You have to find the secrets. If you have the courage to find the secrets of your own self, you will heal. This has been my experience now for 25 years. If you can find the secrets almost always, you know, God willing, it's ultimately in Allah's sense. But if, if Allah will give you healing, a shafi, if you take the time to change yourself. And that's my final message to your listeners. Please, everyone, let's join together. And ask Allah to teach us what's in ourselves so that we can heal ourselves, so that ultimately we can return to be closer to God, which is what it's all about. May Allah inspire us to find, uncover, and unravel the secrets of ourselves. Before we officially conclude uh, today's episode, could you please, uh, Dr. Ibrahim Jaffe, uh, make a dua, a prayer? that us and all the listeners all over the world could join us with, inshallah. Mm, alhamdulillah. I'd be happy to. A'udhu billahi min shaitan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I ask you, my beloved Lord, Ya Allah, Ya Rabb, Ya Allah, Ya Kareem, Ya Allah, Ya Wahab, Ya Allah, Ya Shakur, Ya Shafi, Ya Al-Hayl Qayyum, Ya Quddus. I ask you, my Lord, to send your peace your healing, your blessings, your forgiveness, your care, your divine care on each person, to open each person to the truth, your truth within them, to open the hearts to know the deep love, to know, open the hearts to experience the inner reality of your presence, to open the path to reaching oneness. I ask you, my Lord, to send your forgiveness the forgiveness for all the times that we have experienced pain in ourselves, hurt in ourselves. So many times we have fallen away because we have not been able to contain the decrees and the trials and the tribulations that you have sent to each of us. I ask you, my Lord, to bless all of us with the strength and the courage and the wisdom and the help and the support of the angels and the support of the prophets, peace and blessings upon them all, for us to all arrive in Jannah, and to also for those who are ready to heal, and for those who are ready to go beyond and to become those who may be brought near. Amin. 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 Thank you so much, Dr. Ibrahim Jaffe. It's been an honor, a pleasure to have you with us, and 
we sincerely look forward to having you on this program again in the future, in the near future, inshallah. Ta'ala. We wish you the greatest success with your work and with helping human beings throughout the world awaken to the light and to the love and to the potential of their divine soul that Allah created them with. Alhamdulillah, it really has been a pleasure and an honor. Thank you for uh, allowing us to have this experience with you, and thank you for your insight and sharing all of your experience. Thank you very much, Ahmed. Yeah, I've been delighted with, with, to be on your show, and I really feel you're sincerely um, seeking to help people know the truth. And this is the most important blessing we can we can do. So thank you for inviting me. You're welcome. Alhamdulillah. This brings us to the end of this beautiful episode. Alhamdulillah wa shukrulillah. Thank you, the listeners, for tuning in. Thank you for your love and thank you for your support. Now, to learn more about the amazing, remarkable work of Dr. Ibrahim Jaffe, we here at Soul of Islam Radio highly recommend that you visit his website. That's www.drjaffemd.com. That's D-R-J-A-F-F-E-M-D dot com. We'll also provide links in the episode summary, which will be accessible on our website and our Facebook page. There on that website, you will also find links to some of his seminars, such as Secrets of Sufism, Secrets of Self-Healing, Divine Relationship, and much, much more. To learn more about the University of Spiritual Healing and Sufism, we highly recommend that you visit SufiUniversity.org. And to continue supporting the Soul of Islam radio, please do the following. Like our page on Facebook.com forward slash Soul of Islam radio. Make sure to subscribe and please give us a review and a rating on any of the services that you may come across. And please, please recommend to your family and friends. Visit our website at soulofislamradio.com. There you will find a free multimedia course to help you rediscover the spiritual dimension of Islam. You'll also find subscription links to services such as iTunes, TuneIn, and Spreaker, and links to our personal blogs and social media profiles. Also, you will find a form for you, the listeners, to send in any suggestions or feedback that you may have for our show. And with that, may the peace, the mercy, the blessings, and the light of the divine be upon you all. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.